Uh, 15 minutes. Second big panel of the day, this one is broadly titled, and I think the subjects will be even more broad, which is great, and I welcome, uh, welcome that. Welcome. Assessing market power and anti-competitive conduct in dynamic innovation-driven markets, economic and legal lessons from US v. Microsoft. Uh, there are lots of lessons, so uh, I hope we'll hear things all over the place. Uh, we have five great panelists uh, with us today. I will go in the order very quickly, introduce them in the order in which they're going to speak. First is uh, Frank Fisher, who, as most of you know, was the DOJ's testifying expert witness at the Microsoft trial. Frank has the rare and possibly unprecedented distinction of being the expert economist on opposite sides of two of the biggest antitrust cases in the 20th century, the government side in US v. Microsoft, uh, the defense side, IBM side, and the government's unsuccessful at that point antitrust case against IBM in the 70s. Uh, distinction also shared on the lawyering side by David Boies, who we will hear from uh, later today. Uh, Frank. Uh, is the Carlton Professor of Microeconomics Emeritus at MIT, where he taught for many, many, many years, testified in many uh, antitrust cases beyond these two. Uh, following Frank, Harry First, who is a professor of law at NYU and was from 1999 till 2001 the chief of the Antitrust Bureau at the New York State Attorney General's Office, where he was uh, deeply and heavily involved in this case. Uh, in the middle of our panel, we have a substitution, Tim Bresnahan from Stanford, who had been a DOJ uh, chief economist for a time, uh, is not able to be here because of a last-second family medical emergency uh, in his place. Somewhat uh, unexpectedly for him, and I apologize about that, Jay, is uh, Jay Himes, who is the current chief of the Antitrust Bureau uh, of the State of New York, a position you've held since when, Jay? Remind me. Seems like a very long time, but when did you... 2001, so Jay came in uh, right as the settlement uh, stuff was underway, was there every step of that, and has been very, very heavily involved in all of the compliance uh, and enforcement efforts with Microsoft uh, since that time uh, on behalf of the plaintiff state group. Um, we'll shift then to Keith Hilton, who is a professor of law at Boston University. Uh, he's written uh, widely about antitrust and in particular written uh, a great deal about this case and has focused a lot of attention uh, lately on the European uh, Union case against Microsoft and some comparisons between the EU case and the US case. And then uh, our final panelist will be Doug Melamed, who is now a partner at Wilmer Hale, has been involved in a lot of uh, the last few years, biggest cases at the intersection of antitrust and intellectual property. But during the Microsoft case was initially principal deputy assistant attorney general uh, to Joel <coughs> Klein uh, during the investigation, preparation, and trial of the case. And then after Joel left the division became the acting assistant attorney general in charge of the antitrust division. So we welcome you all. We're very glad we're here. And we'll start off with Frank. Well, thank you. I'm I'm going to begin by giving my stock reply to people who point out that I was on opposite sides <coughs> in those two cases. Uh, the, the nasty reply is that if you really think that these were opposite sides, then you don't understand anything about either case. But since that's not true of you, <coughs> you must understand about at least one of them. Uh, I do feel about, uh, I do feel about uh, what happened in the intervening years, it's like Mark Twain's remark about his father. Mark Twain said that when I was 14 years old, I thought my father was too stupid to live. Uh, when I, by the time I was 21, I was amazed to learn how much the old man had learned in the intervening seven years. That's the way I feel about the antitrust division. <laughs> I'm serious about that, by the way. Uh, I mean that as a, as a great compliment to the antitrust division of the Microsoft case era. Uh, I'm too polite to say that I mean it as a great insult to the previous one, but I do. <laughs> OK. Uh, and they deserved it. All right. Now, we all have our memories of the Microsoft case. I actually have a physical memento, uh, which I'm going to describe to you in a moment, but it, goes, it bears on <clears throat> some of the things uh, that we've been talking about and some of the questions that have been raised. I was asked on cross-examination, there wasn't anything for me but cross-examination, because the direct testimony went in in written form. <clears throat> uh, I was asked, uh, 
what would be the harm if Microsoft were to win the case? And I think that is the same proposition as what would be the harm is if there had been no case at all. And um, <clears throat> that's an interesting question. And as I was asked that question, the questioner, uh, Mr. Lacavara, took a long time asking it. And I suddenly realized, I had the time to realize that what I was going to say was, going, was certainly going to make a, sound, make a sound bite on every news station in the country. Uh, that, of course, did not stop me. And, <laughs> and what, I, what I said was that we would live in a, a Microsoft world when it came to uh, technology in this area. That it might be a good world and it might be a bad world, but it would be a Microsoft-controlled world. Microsoft would control what the innovations could be that worked uh, with Windows or, worked, or, or might, have, might have been competitive to Windows. And I said that that was the uh, modern equivalent of Henry Ford saying the, con the consumer can have uh, any color car he wants so long as it is black. And indeed, that evening, that was on all the newscasts, at least that's what my family said. Now, I have a physical memento related to that, which I'm going to tell you because I think it's amusing. That happened, I think, in December, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And shortly after that came the, the break for uh, the holidays, and um, my son and his wife prepared for me a Hanukkah present, which I had not expected. They brought me a Monopoly set. <laughs> OK. And I looked inside, and the first thing I discovered was that Bill, Bill Gates's face was on the $500 bill. And the second was that all the properties around the board had been stickered over to be software uh, applications, except for the utilities, which were software utilities. And I said, yes. I said, that's highly amusing. Oh, they said, you haven't gotten the point yet. What piece do you want to represent you on the board? So I went to the bags that hold the pieces that represent you on the Monopoly board, and every one of them was filled with nothing but little black cars. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, uh, and I do think that was, you know, that was a prediction of, uh, I can't say it came true, obviously, because uh, we don't know what the world, tr for sure, what the world would have been like. Uh, but as I've listened to what's going on today, uh, my view uh, is that I was probably right, uh, and that what has happened uh, as a result of the case is that we don't live uh, in that kind of world. I was particularly impressed by Brad Smith's remarks uh, on this subject, but I had come to that conclusion uh, beforehand, and I'm glad to hear it. Uh, I do think uh, that Ed Felton's dichotomy between um, increased competition and technological innovation it's very hard to decide between them, but I do think it's in some sense a false dichotomy uh, because innovation doesn't just come about uh, because somebody gets struck with a good idea. Uh, innovation typically costs money, and innovation does come about if, there is, if people see a reason to have a reason to believe it's going to be profitable or they're pressured to do it for fear of falling behind. And that means that competition can, in fact, be a spur to innovation or the possibility of competing can do that. So while I don't know, uh, you know, th those technological innovations which happened after 2003 uh, <clears throat> may perfectly well have been a con in part a consequence of the increased competition uh, introduced by the case. I note that the, the, the remedy hadn't gone into effect, didn't go into effect until <clears throat> around then. All right. Now, uh, what else do I think about uh, the lessons to be learned from the case? <clears throat> well, I think the most important lesson is that there is no need to revise antitrust law or Section 2 in order to deal with innovative industries. I'm not now talking about the recent uh, paper issued by the Justice Department. I'm going to say some, some things about that later. but. If you think about what the economics of the case were, uh, boiled down, uh, they're the following. Uh, and I'm assuming you all know about the, the application's barrier to entry and how it works and so forth. <clears throat> that Microsoft uh, found itself in a position in which it certainly had monopoly power as a result of a natural, uh, a natural effect involving economies of scale and network effects. <clears throat> And had it done nothing more, there wouldn't have been a case. Uh, Microsoft did, however, do things more. It took actions to stop uh, 
threats, or nascent threats to the application's barrier to entry, the most famous one from the browser, but also from Java. And um, <clears throat> it did that even though the actions that it took uh, were not uh, profitable in themselves. Uh, I quote, uh, I know you're going to think I'm a total nerd when I tell you I can quote this exhibit by number, but it's the only exhibit I can quote by number. <laughs> I only know two things from the trial I can quote, I'm sorry, exactly. Uh, that's one, and another is a piece of the trial transcript which I said, in which I said, in fact, you have to remember there was a time when computers were great angry beasts and now they are not the small angry beasts that they have since become. And the transcript has me saying, you must remember there was a time when consumers were great angry beasts. <laughs> but anyway, Government Exhibit 39. Uh, I don't remember who wrote the email, uh, but I do remember that it says, uh, the browser is, is a no revenue product but you should care about it just as much as does Bill Gates, and it goes on in effect to say, because if we lose the browser wars, we lose everything. Uh, and that was a, 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 a perfectly true statement, or at least the first part of it was a perfectly true statement. Uh, Microsoft invented, invested an awful lot <coughs> in uh, improving uh, Internet Explorer, and it also uh, gave it away uh, and it, it, all, it, it gave it away, and it even in paid people in, usually in kind, or in not taking their money uh, in various ways, uh, if they would agree uh, to adopt it. This is the PC people, and, and other things surrounding that. And this was an act which had, you know, a set of acts which had no particular justification on, their own, on its own right. Microsoft said, well, we wanted them to advertise Internet Explorer, so we gave them inducements to take it. But the browser was a no-revenue product. Uh, you know, why do you want everybody to have Internet Explorer? And so on. And uh, that was, uh, that's an anti-competitive act. I don't care whether that happened in an innovative industry or in a non-innovative industry. Uh, that sort of thing undertaken by a company with a, uh, a, uh, with, with a great deal of market power, which Microsoft certainly had, <coughs> uh, is anti-competitive. And that's basically uh, what the liability case uh, was about. Uh, and the fact that Microsoft was, and I hope still is, innovative, uh, is interesting and important, but had nothing, has nothing to do uh, with, with, with that. I don't say that innovation, innovative companies uh, or innovation generally doesn't present new, new areas to think about <coughs> when dealing with antitrust cases, but it doesn't, I think, call for a basic revision uh, of the standards. Okay. A few more <coughs> lessons. Uh, <sighs> One should, of course, this is a self-serving comment. You have to understand that, even though I am semi-retired from the expert witnessing business. You should try to understand the economics of the case before you jump in. All right? I'm really serious about that. This is not the worst example. Uh, I, can't, I can't help doing it. Where'd he go? David, David's not here, right? Well, I should, boys. Well, tell him, you can tell him I said this afterwards. The worst example I know was another case in which I worked with David Boyce, in which the complaint was drawn up far in advance, um, and the economics were all, all very peculiar in the, in the complaint. Uh, but one should try to do that. Uh, had that been done uh, and done properly, I think perhaps the tying claim would not have been there. I said yesterday that the, the tying claim doesn't make any real sense. Uh, because monopolization of the um, browser market for its own sake didn't make any sense. The browser, as I said, was a no revenue product <coughs> and at the time anyway there weren't a lot of profits to be earned by monopolizing. It was being monopolized uh, or being, uh, the actions were being taken to protect uh, the uh, monopoly power in the uh, operating systems market. Um, you would be surprised, by the way, this has nothing to do with the behavior of the counsel in either case. During the case, I received at least two and I think more papers 
uh, some to referee for journals by economists who had extremely elaborate theoretical models proving that it could not possibly profit Microsoft uh, to monopolize the, uh, to, tie the, to tie the browser uh, to the operating system, except under very extreme conditions. And that was just totally beside the point. They were perfectly good papers, but they weren't about this case, uh, despite the fact that the authors obviously thought they were. Um, on the other hand, <coughs> Uh, one of the things I'm now going to, to shade into the, uh, oh, I'm sorry, on the other side of the case, um, I always thought that Microsoft did an awful lot of trying to fight this case in the court of public opinion. And in fact, even in court, tried to fight it as a marketing uh, case. Uh, in various ways, uh, pointing out how important their product was, how innovative they had been, uh, and so forth. And in certain respects, which I don't want to go, go back into because it's probably too painful, uh, just not being, not being very careful and their lawyers not being very careful about what was happening in the exhibits that they tried to put in. I'm, uh, I'm not going to go into detail. It's not necessary. Uh, okay. Now, I come now to uh, the recent uh, statement of the Justice Department and the objections by the FTC. I cannot say that I have studied these in detail. <clears throat> so this is a top of the head reaction uh, to some of it, uh, or perhaps a back of the envelope uh, react. I'm not using, reading from an envelope, but you know what I mean. Um, okay. <clears throat> I think there's something to be said but probably not everything to be said for the Justice Department's position. If, in fact, it does as I think it tries to do in some respects, the following. <clears throat> Lawyers are just terribly, terribly fond of bright line tests. And, of course, they're, all, they're fond, or at least the plaintiffs are always fond of per se tests. Uh, and in anything but the simplest circumstances, those things don't really work very well. They particularly don't work very well for tying cases. And if what the uh, DOJ is saying about the rule of reason there is, you know, we're going to get serious about examining the economics of what's going on and not rely on fairly silly tests like how much is outside and how much is inside the bundle, which in comp cases more complicated than the standard classic tie, uh, it's very, very difficult to make any sense of, and possibly even in the standard case. Uh, then I think that's a, that's a rather good idea. Uh, I do agree that if you get rid of things like that, it's going to make it easier uh, for uh, people who want to take anti-competitive actions to get away with it. I think that under Section 2. That's true. Uh, <clears throat> and I'm sorry, I don't know anything. I, have, I don't really know anything about the people who now work for the Justice Department, but one can't help feeling that uh, that's not how shall I put it, dissonant with the general behavior of the present administration in Washington. Um, you like that? Yeah, I like that. Okay. Uh, uh, on the other hand, like it. Yeah. Yes. on the other hand, uh, there, is, there is another thing in there of which I thoroughly approve. Uh, and now I'm going to say something uh, that annoyed me about the states. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, as a number of you probably know, I am a principal proponent of the proposition that you can't look at accounting profits and infer anything at all about monopoly. Uh, and uh, in the early days of putting that forward, uh, you would think that I had tried to deface the National Monument, as I once <laughs> pointed out, but never mind. I'm not going to go through that argument again. Uh, and indeed, in the Microsoft case, uh, I pretty well insisted to the DOJ that that not be a part of their case. I insisted successfully. It was, however, a part of the state's cases. Oh, well, your witness, 
Rick Warren Bolton got up and testified to, to that. Well, I got asked every morning of my cross-examination whether I agreed with the quote from Rick Warren Bolton that profits really mattered. Okay, good. Then I apologize. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> but, but I did. I did get. I did. Get, Rick did say something about it. I was there. <clears throat> yeah, all right, he wrote something, and I got asked every morning about that proposition, <clears throat> and I had an answer. But okay. But anyway, but I am delighted. <laughs> really delighted. I thought this was coming from some call I had previously with the. Uh, a couple of years ago from the uh, antitrust division. I am really delighted to discover that in the new paper from the uh, DOJ, there is a section on profits that essentially says you can't do this. You know, that this is very unreliable, unreliable evidence. And I think that's right. Uh, and I'll stop with another short memento. You know, I lived through the IBM case. I lived through it for many, 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 many years. Uh, I couldn't attend the first meeting on the case in May of 1970 because my youngest child was being born and my wife thought I should be there. Uh, the case lasted so long that that same child read galley proof on my book, uh, <laughs> which appeared not long after the case. But anyhow, in the course of this, the wealth of evidence about profits and the discussion about profits, it was, it was, it was appalling, and not to mention bizarre. And I'm uh, you know, really glad to see, as I said before, uh, that the DOJ had learned something in the intervening whatever number of years uh, it has been. Thank you. Thanks, Frank. Harry? So I'm glad this was up behind Frank all the time, so you were really watching the title of my slides um, as he was speaking. I, I thought as I, as I was thinking about what in the world I was going to say here, um, and I you know, wrote some stuff down, it occurred to me that what I was writing through the whole thing really bore this title, Is the Microsoft Case Important? And then I thought, what better group to ask this to than a group of Microsoft junkies? Because... <laughs> You, certainly I, uh, have invested an awful lot in the Microsoft case, probably thank ourselves, you know, thank God they brought this case uh, because it's kept us busy for so long. And, you know, everyone would probably initially say, of course, it was important. But then you might also say, well, was it important? And um, maybe even more interestingly, as I listen to the discussion, important in what ways? Because we do have a variety of perspectives from you know, legal perspectives, business perspectives, technology community, and so forth. And, and there might be a number of different ways in which it is or isn't important. So um, that's my title, and I'm sticking to it, as they say. Uh, so I'm going to talk about three things. Uh, reframing would be one. Uh, the second is the evolution of the case, which I think is interesting to think about. And then third, remedy, which I think is really pretty critical. So we have the, um, what Andy and I have written about this a little bit, uh, you can think of as the frames that have been put around the case, which have varied uh, from time to time. So you have the original frame of the case, which came in the complaints. And um, I thought it was interesting when Phil described the complaints yesterday, you started with uh, the third claim in the complaint, which was the monopolization claim. But actually, the first claim was exclusive dealing and other anti-competitive effects. The second claim was tying. The third claim was monopolization. And the fourth was attempt to monopolize the browser market. Now, I didn't write the complaint, so I don't know. But you would think you would start with the thing that's sort of most important in the case as number one. So, even from you know, the initial frame of the case, 
uh, we start to think about it uh, a little differently. Uh, there was, of course, all the anti-competitive conduct, cut off the air supply and all of that, um, and the monopolization claim. Um, the, and I say complaints because we have to remember we've heard a lot um, about the states here. The states had a somewhat different complaint, uh, not completely, but broader in the initial complaint. It included the DOS story we heard yesterday. Uh, it included a claim about office and the pricing of office. Uh, now, and it also included interoperability of software generally. Um, now, as it became clear that Judge Jackson was not going to have a trial to last forever, like the IBM case, uh, the states pulled back uh, some of those claims in the first amended complaint and narrowed the framework. But when we got to trial, um, the frame expanded a little bit again. Um, it, uh, it wasn't just the jihad to win the browser war. I always love that. We would love certain Microsoft documents. That's the one I like, which uh, was quoted in the complaint. Um, browsers were now transformed into middleware, a much larger product. Uh, and other things came in besides the browser war. So you had things about real networks and streaming technology. You had IBM's OS. You had other things that came into uh, the trial. And this is what Judge Jackson dealt with in his findings of fact, this much broader framework um, of the story. Uh, on appeal, uh, it changed again narrower. Appeals do that necessarily. Appeals courts don't sit to listen to everything. And we were back to the browser war uh, as the focus. Uh, but I think the real reframing in a sense comes in the Court of Appeals opinion itself and the methodology that it brought to the case uh, with using the rule of reason. Um, because whatever one thinks about that as an approach, in the DC Circuit's hands, what it meant was segmenting all of Microsoft's conduct into sort of bite size that's B-I, not B-Y, bite size pieces, uh, which could then be analyzed. Some were good, some were bad, we'll throw this out, this was bad, this was good. Um, and in some ways, by not looking at the conduct overall as a whole, uh, which was how I think Judge Jackson saw it, and I think how it was presented at trial, um, you have this first, in a sense, trivializing of the case. Um, trivial in the sense that it's about discrete little pieces, and so we can see what, what's illegal, what's not, and it trivializes potentially the remedy as well, because then you're focused on just fixing those particular parts. Uh, and um, I think uh, the reframing, in a sense, of the remedy becomes particularly critical uh, in a couple of ways. Uh, one is um, a statement which seems perfectly correct when made, um, and that's the notion that the remedy should be tailored to fit the wrong, um, which tailored to fit the occasion for the remedy. So uh, this tailoring principle sounds right, but on the other hand, it really does narrow the enterprise of remedy, instead of looking more broadly, perhaps, at how you can make the market more competitive, you want to say, which contractual provisions should we say you can't do? So that's one important part. Um, the second, though, is the Court of Appeals notion of um, what the government's role and how we're going to think about Section 2 in a way. There's a bit at the beginning of the Court of Appeals opinion where it talks about how um, because this is a high technology industry, it's one of the few places, Frank is right, where the court really talks about um, high technology, uh, we might not have an effective remedy. There might not be an effective conduct remedy. There might not be an effective structural remedy. Oh, well. So what, is, you know, what does that mean that perhaps the courts move so slowly? Uh, it means, and this is the full quote, I've got it on the slide, the government will continue to have an interest in defining the contours of the antitrust laws so that law-abiding firms will have a clear sense of what is permissible and what is not. And the threat of private damage actions will remain to deter those firms inclined to test the limits of the law. So the government's in the business of just bringing cases to set precedent. I guess you can do that just by writing a 230-page report. And you know that's just as good because, and why bother to go to trial? It's, more efficient to do it that way. We'll just, that's their view. And the private parties will take up the slack. Um, now, subsequent events may have 
indicated what perhaps was in the Court of Appeals' minds, that's a pretty ineffective remedy. It's going to be really hard for private parties to do this. So it's a very, it's in a sense reframing Section 2 as well that's going on in the Court of Appeals' uh, case. So the second part is the evolution of the case. And um, in some sense, from my point of view, this is where it gets interesting. Um, I noticed that um, this is the title that Phil has picked is U.S. versus Microsoft 10 years later. And the title of my remarks is The Microsoft Case, because in 1998, the European case started when Sun complained to the Europeans. And um, the case has continued to evolve, um, not only in how the remedies worked, but in litigation after the settlement in 2001. So there are two particular parts that I think um, we should think about. One is the importance of intellectual property uh, and innovation. Uh, intellectual property in the U.S. case was sort of a sideshow. Microsoft's um, arguments were, uh, I would say, sort of incoherent. On, I don't know if any of the people who crafted them are here, so um, so be it. Uh, the uh, Jackson sort of brushed them aside. The D.C. Circuit uh, said they bordered on the frivolous. Go to Europe, though. Um, Microsoft brings these arguments much more front and center, and I think it was a very wise move for a number of reasons. One is, of course, one of the two claims of abuse of dominance deals with an intellectual property right. It said you didn't give Sun information, and Microsoft says we had uh, an intellectual property right to refuse to license this information. So you have this direct conflict. But the second is the importance of innovation. Um, it was there a trial, if you recall Jackson's penultimate uh, paragraph, uh, I don't remember the number 403, well anyway, someone knows it here, uh, where you know, he talked about how um, you know, Microsoft's behavior hobbled a form of innovation. Right? But that sort of dropped out of the case in a way on appeal because it's really hard to prove what that means. Um, but Microsoft made this a very important part of its argument to the European Commission, ultimately to the Court of First Instance, that it invested billions of dollars in uh, these protocols, um, you know, the communications between server to server and server to the PC, and if you don't let us get a return on that investment, we won't innovate anymore, nor will anyone else. Uh, a key argument about the connection between intellectual property rights and innovation. The um, European Commission didn't accept the argument, um, talked about the importance, and it's something that's come out in discussion here, the importance of competition itself on Microsoft's incentives to innovate. That, as the Commission said, um, sharing with Sun and having them as a more viable competitor might liven up competition in the marketplace. The CFI just simply said, I think, well, this was Microsoft's burden to show that it wouldn't innovate, and they didn't carry that burden. Uh, but you can also see, and I have this here, the Justice Department's concern over time in the evolution uh, about intellectual property rights can be seen a bit in their own press releases. Uh, in 2004, when Hugh Pate complained about the European Commission decision as being just wrongheaded, um, he said about the interoperability part um, that that sort of considerably overlapped with the remedy in the U.S. side, which required compulsory disclosure of the protocols. But by the CFI decision in 2007, the Justice Department had changed its tune uh, and now was complaining about how the forced disclosure of this information uh, was, could chill innovation and um, you know, would involve potential harms to consumers, um, dominant companies should be allowed to refuse to license intellectual property rights to become much more of a theme from the Justice Department and much more concern. Uh, so um, this has continued actually on the European side. I don't uh, some people here have read a speech and a uh, paper that was given by Bo Westerdorf who was the president of the CFI. Last thing he did was see this case come down. He retires, and then he writes about it. Sort of like Steve Williams saying, I'm, let me tell you about what really went on uh, in the Court of Appeals. That's, but not that Festerdorf says that, but what does come through in this is his great concern 
that the CFI decision will harm innovation and will cut down on intellectual property rights holders. So this is a continuing evolution uh, of the case. Institutionally, the evolution through the European Commission uh, shows that, um, as I said, DOJ no longer rules. Uh, this is a global world uh, that we're living in, and uh, I think Brad Smith made this point in his remarks. If uh, one of the things that's really important about the Microsoft case is the evolution of antitrust into a global enterprise. It is not just restricted to what happens in the United States, and we just can't think of it that way. Uh, so as much as the Justice Department as the dominant firm would like to maintain its dominance, um, it does face other institutional uh, enforcers, and I think that's one of the important parts uh, of the evolution. So let's talk about remedies, uh, which um, is sort of the end game, I think. Uh, uh, just a brief slide here. Consumer suits, lots of them, 220, 80 percent class actions, lots of legal hurdles, as we know. Um, settlements, um, mostly voucher settlements, but not just for Microsoft products. Uh, the total value of these I actually don't have a figure on, nor does Microsoft apparently, although I'm glad to hear it if they're willing, they've got it now. But uh, my understanding is until all the dust settles and the Cypre stuff is figured out, um, we, we won't know. It's substantial. Uh, that the, the end time is roughly 2012. This will put it almost two decades from the time when Bill Gates wrote his internet title memo, just to give a sense. We're gonna have this conference 10 more years from now, don't worry. Uh, competitor suits, uh, this is real money. Um, again, uh, quoting our speaker before, 3.4 billion if you add it all up, and it's in all parts of the litigation. Uh, browser wars, settlements, uh, the OS claims, the OEM claims, uh, and one interesting part, I think, in particular, the EC case, which involved um, the media player and involved server um, operating systems, generated U.S. cases and U.S. settlements, and not insignificant amounts, and the Koreans as well. The Korean suit actually was filed in Korea, so if you're looking for other places in which to practice, Think about that. Um, remedies uh, in the EU. It, people in the room know about what the US remedies are, so I'd like to focus on what may be less well known. 497 million for the two violations, abuse of dominance, that's roughly 600 million. At the time, Microsoft is fortunate that the dollar was stronger then, so it cost less. Um, injunction, a simple injunction, as opposed to what we did in the US, refrain from repeating uh, what you did. Um, and the two behavioral remedies, unbundle media player to offer the standalone version and provide it, the information withheld from Sun on interoperability on reasonable and non-discriminatory terms and a monitoring trustee as we had similar to what we have in the U.S. So on the interoperability part, uh, November 2005, a penalty decision, um, the information virtually impossible to use, their uh, experts found, uh, and setting out in, not quite clear how this came about, but setting out what reasonable fees are supposed to be. Microsoft's, the protocols have to be their creation. The second part, I think, is the most interesting. The protocols have to be innovative um, and using, in effect, a patent standard, um, not obviousness, non-obviousness, whatever exactly that means. Some of the protocols, most are not, but some are non-patented. The Commission has put those aside, just looking at the ones that were not covered by intellectual property rights and consistent with market valuation for comparable technology. And then the fines that came, uh, $280 million for the disclosure failure, and then the biggie, um, to, in February 2008, 899 million euros, $1.3 billion, for unreasonable fees. And one of the interesting things of that is the annex to the Commission's decision, 69 pages of going through protocol by protocol of 173 protocols, finding 166 of the technologies uh, disclosed were not innovative. So if you're thinking back on Microsoft's claim that if they don't um, get to keep these secret, they won't innovate, according at least to the European Commission, well, they didn't innovate anyway. Okay, remedies effect, That's the, this is the real question, and 
Um, what I did was, you know, sort of you start with the markets that were at the core of the U.S. case. Um, share of the OS market, you've, these are the latest from net applications. So 91% if you include the Mac, which as we know was not included in the U.S. case, 99% um, roughly uh, Linux has a trace. Uh, share of the browser market, 72% Firefox. Of course, that wasn't a market, as we found out from the D.C. Circuit, but everyone knows it's a market. So 72% um, Firefox has 20%, and Chrome got 1% on its first day. How's that? So um, obviously a different story, but um, from you know, a U.S. law point of view, 72% in most circuits uh, in the U.S. would be monopoly power. Um, on the European side, share of the workgroup server operating systems market, if you look at the European Commission cases, and they, they're always very long and, and always in a late paragraph or in a footnote, they say, well, actually Microsoft share has been increasing ever since 2004 and continues to. The Windows XP Home Edition, um, 1,787 copies as of April. 2006, that doesn't sound like a whole lot. This was the figure that the European Commission's lawyer told the CFI in oral argument and conceded that the remedy was a failure. The reason for the failure, though, may be that the price for the unbundled and bundled was exactly the same. Hmm, I wonder which one I should take. So what's the conclusion? Is the Microsoft case important? Um, there may be many reasons to say yes or no, but one reason to say yes is thanks to Europe. I think Europe has given the whole case uh, continued salience, as they say, and it continues to go along with the current complaints that have been filed, including a complaint that's going to start the browser war case again by Opera saying you can't bundle IE into Windows. Uh, but how about, what do we say about the remedy? Uh, I think the civil litigation uh, recoveries um, shouldn't be scoffed at. Um, you know, uh, injured consumers uh, were uh, compensated, and I think that's an important function for antitrust law. The civil fines, which people in the U.S. tend to scoff at, um, as the, that latest report did and the AMC did, uh, are substantial. I think of Judge Jackson's mule trainer um, analogy, if you'll recall, this is one of the things he said to one of the reporters, uh, well, you know about the mule trainer, how does he work? He whoops him upside the head, and that's how he gets the mule's attention. So I'm not calling Microsoft the mule, but corporations generally, um, you know, you look at this money and, you know, you say, um, you know, Microsoft uh, has paid, you know, one point, it's now 2.3 billion roughly uh, in fines. You start to maybe start to pay attention to that money. I don't think that that's nothing. Um, and the EU's review of Microsoft's pricing, I think, is interesting because it shows if you want to, and I leave that aside, if you want to start looking more closely at the pricing of a monopolist, it's not impossible to do, as U.S. commentators always say it is. Uh, bottom line, though, I think um, I right, flunking remedy 101. Um, if you look at all the remedies, uh, we can argue over whether they've worked because no one really set out what the goals were. There were no benchmarks for whether you've achieved them or not. Um, and my real concern is if the remedy in the end is perceived as unimportant, and I was glad that Microsoft perceives it as very important, but to think about what that means. But in the end, from a public policy point of view, if it's perceived as unimportant, it really is the ultimate bad rap against antitrust and the trivialization of antitrust because if you don't get anything out of it, it wasn't a great case, it was a bad case to bring. So that's it. Thanks, Harry. Jay, we've just heard about flunking remedy 101. Yeah, uh, that happy note. <laughs> uh, I, I, it's always, I like to leave it to Jay to get the, excuse get the good me. grade. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, I am Harry's successor at the New York AG's office in charge of antitrust. He left there uh, in April, I think, of 2001, and I joined at that point. Uh, the case was up on appeal then and um, came down in June, if I remember. Um, we were asked, actually, we were scheduled to come talk to Microsoft about negotiating the settlement. Um, beginning in the fall of that year, uh, 
And um, I was with one of my senior staff people, a fellow who tried the case because he at that point knew something about the case and I didn't, uh, sitting in an airplane uh, waiting to take off at 9 o'clock one morning in September, uh, and it actually happened to be September 11th. Uh, that airplane didn't take off. Uh, we never got to the first settlement negotiations uh, that day. Uh, but we did get ordered by the judge a couple of weeks after that to do uh, uh, what she described as round-the-clock uh, negotiations, and she told us, if you can't uh, agree after a couple of weeks, that's okay. Um, we have a way of making you talk. Um, <laughs> and, and it amounted to appointing uh, a mediator um, who then led the negotiations for the next uh, month or five weeks, uh, leading, of course, uh, eventually to the settlement uh, involving the DOJ and uh, uh, New York and nine or eight other states, and then, and then of course, the split off in the litigation uh, by California, Iowa, and uh, another group of states altogether. So uh, that's, that's the background uh, that I bring to this, and uh, I, I am one of these people, for better or for worse, I guess, to whom you can attribute the consent decree. Um, uh, I, I, it's fair, I think, that you should know how I came here. Uh, I, I was looking at the program a few weeks ago, and I said to Phil G., um, I see the program online, you don't have any state enforcers uh, involved. And he said, well, you know, Jay, it's a lot of date. We think Steve Hauck is going to come. He didn't mention anything about Harry, but it's nice to see him here. Uh, and, and, and Phil said to me, but if you'd like to come, we'll be happy to, um, you know, to find some place for you. And, and I said, well, let me think about that. And I came back to Phil a couple of days later. And I said, gee, I can make it up on a Saturday, um, and, and, you know, uh, I'll, I'll go anywhere you think I can contribute. And... Um, uh, Phil came back and said, well, what would you like to do? And I said, I, well, Saturday, I, there's this panel I could contribute a little bit on, and that panel I could contribute a little bit on. I didn't hear from Phil, and then, you know, about 20 minutes ago, he came up to me and said, Jay, how would you like to be on this panel? It was good. Neither, neither, none of the panels I'd suggested, but that's okay. You get the same pitch, I think. Um, um, Harry says we flunked remedies. Um, Certainly, we didn't set out to uh, achieve that result. Uh, I think that the objective was to, uh, uh, through both prohibitory provisions and uh, through uh, affirmative disclosures, to uh, try to address uh, the application's barrier to entry and to uh, try uh, to uh, knock down the, the buttressing that uh, we believed occurred by virtue of the exclusionary conduct that Microsoft had previously engaged in. It was through that um, combination of provisions an intention to try to make the industry uh, more friendly for the development of uh, features that uh, would offer competition to uh, the Windows monopoly. The Windows monopoly, as you all know, and I hope there's not terribly much repetition um, from, from yesterday, but of course it's a, it's a, uh, a network, uh, it's a product with network effects and the application's barrier to entry is part and parcel of those network effects. And um, my sense, and I'm not, I don't, I don't claim to be an expert on network effects, but where you get a monopoly in that kind of area, it's pretty hard to dislodge. You've got to move the platform. You've got to find somebody uh, who can offer a different alternative altogether to the network, and that's pretty hard to do. Uh, just breaking down the network, I think, is, is near impossible. So, um, you know, with our great foresight, what we thought was that somehow, uh, just as middleware uh, might operate to uh, uh, break down uh, the application's barrier to entry and move, create the opportunity to move the platform, uh, that if it were possible to enable features both uh, from the internet uh, or through uh, competing middleware the way uh, Netscape and, and Java promised, that it might be possible to introduce competition into the, uh, the operating system area. And the overall objective of uh, the remedy that we selected uh, w was designed to achieve that effect. Of course, uh, Jackson had suggested a structural remedy, uh, 
Um, the Court of Appeals had overturned him on that. There was pretty strong language uh, in the opinion uh, of the Court of Appeals telling us that that was, uh, if it, it, it wasn't formally pulled off the table, but it did not appear to some of us to be a viable alternative um, at, at the point that we were on remand. Um, the result is, uh, w you know, what you do see in the, uh, the settlement and by for all practical purposes, the settlement is the same as the, the decree that came out of the state's subsequent litigation. There were some changes, but I don't think they, you would call them material. Um, and um, we, have, we have sought, certainly in large measure through the affirmative provisions, the protocol disclosure provisions, uh, and to a lesser extent the API provisions, uh, to give people in the industry, industry participants, a better opportunity to uh, communicate uh, with the Windows client in hopes that they could develop uh, uh, features that would promote uh, uh, a kind of cross-platform uh, opportunities. Uh, the um, people, I, I don't know how much of this is repetitious, uh, but the communications protocol uh, section of the decree which preceded by uh, an, a considerable period of time the EC's remedy, uh, has involved an enormous industry, uh, I'm sorry, an enormous uh, uh, enforcement effort, uh, <laughs> secured in large measure through the technical committee and uh, the software engineers uh, that uh, they have engaged to uh, <laughs> develop the, the protocol documentation and to push Microsoft into making that documentation uh, more satisfactory to in industry users. The documentation that the EC uh, found to be wholly inadequate was the stuff we were looking at by and large. Uh, there were some minor differences. We had years earlier, uh, but non-publicly, uh, declared it to be inadequate as well. And uh, we had developed ways to uh, push Microsoft to make it better, and those culminated ultimately in a 2006 admission in court uh, that the documentation they were previously relying on uh, was indeed not satisfactory for anybody and a commitment on Microsoft's part uh, to rewrite it, and they have been doing that, uh, and that process uh, continues even today. Uh, it engages uh, on the order of 40 engineers, uh, software engineers that work for the technical committee uh, out in uh, uh, Redmond. They have offices in Bellevue and in uh, Palo Alto, California. That's been a very, very major effort. Uh, it engages me, it engages Steve Hauck and their consultant uh, and DOJ people uh, on an ongoing regular basis, scarcely a day goes by that I don't have communications uh, with somebody uh, on, on that activity. Um, it involves, of course, not only the, the, the disclosure provisions, but also monitoring uh, the operations uh, of Windows to make sure that uh, as, as Windows evolves, as IE evolves, there's a new version of the operating system, Windows 7, on the table now, that those versions are compliant uh, with the requirements of the final judgment. And um, that is not, by the way, an easy task. Um, the conduct uh, provisions, you know, are self-executing. Uh, you, you're not supposed to, um, um, you know, there they, are very um, prohibitions against coercion of OEMs and things like that and ISVs. But um, keeping the operating system compliant, uh, particularly in the places where Microsoft had to um, create defaults and uh, make the, uh, the operating system honor them uh, is not an easy uh, operation. In fact, we knew it was going to be technically challenging uh, when we negotiated the remedies provision. Um, and for that reason, uh, expected we were going to have to have technical expertise on, our, on a regular basis. Um, it took, uh, I think, the technical committee at, over a year, frankly, to uh, develop tools that satisfactorily probed uh, Windows and determined whether, uh, in fact, Windows removed all of the IE icons uh, that it was required to remove if a user, in fact, sought to uh, hide end user access, which was uh, the way of substituting middleware. 
Microsoft, of course, said we have, uh, we have, we have rejiggered the operating system. It does it. It works if, you, uh, if a user goes in and chooses Firefox as its browser instead of IE. Uh, we remove the icons. Uh, in, in fact, that wasn't the case. There were places in the operating system where the icons remained. Uh, the technical committee then had a dialogue with Microsoft about why that was the case. Was there some reasonable technical requirement that the final judgment permitted uh, um, so that the icon and the uh, invocation of IE was, was acceptable, or was it not? And um, getting all of those kinds of little things was very difficult. Uh, it's not an easy remedy uh, in, in that sense. This is Windows. It is not uh, a simple thing, and just changing it is not simple. So. I don't know whether you say we flunked under those circumstances. Um, it certainly is the case uh, that the Windows market share is formidable. And, and I, I was, I, I guess, uh, when Brad spoke a few minutes ago, he mentioned consolidation in the OEM uh, uh, industry. And he said, you know, they've gone from hundreds of companies uh, when the case started to a much smaller number today. And you can imagine. Uh, the dialogue that, that Microsoft, therefore, has to have uh, with the few companies uh, that remain uh, in the OEM business. And um, when he said that, I thought from time to time I hear from the OEMs, and um, uh, they will voice problems to me, and they will say, we voice these concerns to Microsoft. Uh, and the two of them talk, and that's a good thing, and they communicate about things in Windows that they don't like or changes that Microsoft proposes to make that they think aren't consistent necessarily with the OEM's attempts to differentiate their products from each other. Um, and, you know, it, it, sometimes they accommodate each other, sometimes they don't, and that's generally when they come to me. But the point really is... Um, when, Windows, when Microsoft feels one way about the operating system and the OEMs feel another way about the operating system uh, and how they want it to work on their computers, the OEMs still don't have a plan B. Uh, there still is no other operating system uh, that they could possibly realistically go to. Uh, and that uh, <coughs> is a condition today, and it was, of course, a condition uh, 10 years ago. Uh, we do think that there are circumstances in the industry uh, that will contribute uh, to lessening that sort of uh, position. And, and certainly the delivery of internet-based services, which you've heard about today and which uh, uh, Ed talked about today, the delivery of services through browsers, uh, those kinds of developments are encouraging. Uh, uh, changes in the industry that uh, we would hope over time, uh, in, in one way or another, give the, the end user a better opportunity to choose features uh, and choose uh, an ability to uh, find alternatives to Windows. But um, it, is, it is certainly a difficult uh, kind of problem in a networks industry and in one uh, that is so central to uh, a lot of what we do uh, today. Uh, I, Phil, right. I hope I've taken up my 10 minutes. Right. You've, you've done a great job. Thanks, Jay. I appreciate you stepping in and appreciate you being uh, a good sport about it and especially not giving me a hard time about it. That's great. So, thanks. Uh, Keith Hilton. Thanks. Thanks, thanks Phil. 15 um, years after, I expect a better position, okay? <laughs> Yeah, I, I want to talk about f uh, four topics. I don't think I'll be able to get through all of them, so Phil just cut me off when, if, if I don't make it through. Um, so I want to talk about the framing of the legal standard uh, that Harry talked about. I want to say a little bit about that. I want to talk about remedies, a little bit about innovation and monopolization, and uh, lastly, EU and the world, uh, or I should say uh, the U.S. and the world. Maybe I should put it that way. Um, so I, maybe I should switch the order since everyone's been talking about remedies for the past few minutes. Maybe I should deal with remedies first because I, I hadn't planned to talk about that first. But you know, it strikes me that um, I would be worried about trying to determine the effectiveness of, re of any remedies by looking at market share evidence or things like that. I mean, I, uh, you know, that's, that's I, I think it's um, a bad way to try to determine uh, 
uh, and in particular, you'd like to ask, well, what, are, what, what is the best approach to remedies? Um, and try to have some theory about remedies or what remedies are supposed to do. I think one of the best discussions of remedies in the case law is Judge Wazanski's opinion in the United Shoe uh, uh, decision where he gets to remedies. Uh, and, and he uh, raises some important questions about what remedies are supposed to do and, and the ideal approach to remedies. It seems to me that you'd like to have kind of a, light, a sliding scale approach where uh, it, to the extent that the firm's conduct has a, a strong efficiency component, those are the cases in which, or I should say pro-competitive, pro-consumer efficiency component, those are the cases in which you want narrow remedies, remedies that are surgical and go after exactly the kind of conduct that you think is bad and you'd like to stop. In cases where um, the firm's conduct doesn't have a strong efficiency component, well, yeah, then you want, uh, you, know, uh, you know, large, uh, very effective, you know, powerful remedies um, and, you know, uh, the, the, the dissolution and structural remedy approach may be desirable. So you can distinguish uh, cases involving um, price fixing, just for example, you know, and I know that's not relevant to the monopolization case, but price fixing, naked price fixing as an example of something that has no efficiency component and therefore you don't have to worry about surgical remedies in that case. But when you've got conduct that, that is, uh, that's efficient, pro-consumer, then you really ought to be careful about remedies, and the narrow, rem narrow surgical remedies are best. Um, so I wouldn't regard, I wouldn't, it doesn't strike me that uh, you can make a decision or make a conclusion that, uh, that, uh, there's, that the remedies have flunked, uh, and I'd be worried about any approach to, um, to measuring the success of remedies by looking at market share and seeing whether you've, you've uh, punished a corporation as, as sufficiently. So um, the second not to topic I want to talk about is this, just the framing of l the legal standard uh, because anyone, I guess Harry runs into this problem, he teaches antitrust and as a teacher of antitrust, when you get to the Microsoft decision, you're asking yourself, well, what do we learn about this and how does this, what does this tell us about the legal standard for monopolization? And uh, just as a brief thumbnail sketch on the legal standards for monopolization, you could say roughly there too. You know, there, 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 there's a lot of talk out, about, out there about uh, different approaches to monopolization tests, but I, I think they pretty much shake down to two approaches. One is something that's described often as a welfare balancing approach, and, and that you see in the Microsoft decision. You know, read, open up the Microsoft opinion, you'll see the court uh, articulate that test, which is comparing the pro-competitive benefits of the uh, defendant's conduct with the anti-competitive effects, pro-competitive effects versus anti-competitive effects. Uh, it's, uh, maybe you could describe it sometimes as, as a disproportionality test. Are the anti-competitive effects disproportional to whatever pro-competitive effects have come out of the firm's conduct? Um, it, it's not clear how you do that balancing, but at least in theory that's what courts are saying. That's what the Microsoft uh, opinion says it's going to do. Uh, and then another version uh, you can just describe as a specific and intent test, which asks, well, uh, is there, is there uh, a substantial efficiency component? Does, does the firm's conduct increase the value of, of the good to consumers or lower the cost of supply? And if that's the case, then uh, the firm can't be held liable under Section 2, and you don't engage in some kind of balancing. Now, there's a question there about how you measure intent. Um, and you can take an, a, 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 the specific intent approach that I've just suggested involves an objective approach to intent where you're looking at the firm's conduct, and that's different from what you'd say is a, what you'd describe as a subjective approach to intent where you're looking for internal emails and, and memoranda. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of t talk about that yesterday, and the, the, you know that's uh, I think there are uh, are. Uh, good statements of the problems with the subjective intent approach. You know, one obvious problem is it creates this incentive going forward that uh, firms have to have lawyers look over their documents, and the unsophisticated firms, the firms that don't have lawyers look over their documents, do the same thing as their rivals do, but they're the ones that get, uh, they get caught and, and that get punished under Section 2. So that would seem to be a bizarre system uh, where you have the, the only firms that get into trouble are the unsophisticated firms, whereas the sophisticated firms do the same things, 
but don't get into, into any trouble for it because there, there aren't these damaging emails or memoranda. So uh, that's, that's a, a serious problem with the subjective approach and something that um, has led many courts to take a view that, uh, that they'd like to get away from that. For example, uh, Judge Breyer in the Barry Wright decision um, is very critical of the subjective approach to, uh, to assessing intent. So consistent with this specific intent approach, you know, you look at the Microsoft case and you say, well, okay, what did the firm do? Well, it seems the core of the case involves this bundling of Internet Explorer with the Windows operating system or the technological tying of it, which increases the value of the overall operating system and you could say lowers the cost of supply of this application consistent with what Microsoft had been doing for a long time with standalone applications, bundling them into the operating system, which uh, increased the value of the operating system and benefited consumers. So right away, you, st uh, you start off on this, uh, if, thinking that if a court is going to apply a specific intent approach, that uh, Microsoft is in a pretty good position and that the plaintiffs have a hard way to go. Okay, so I was going to say something about the, the evolution of this standard. You know, the first 50 years or so of monopolization law uh, from the passage of the statute until Learned Hand's opinion in Alcoa, uh, the courts operated under the specific intent standard. And, and then Judge Hand rewrote the law in Alcoa, and we've had the welfare balancing approach since Judge Hand's Alcoa decision. So that's, the, that's the, what we have right now uh, for the most part. But... You know, you can see a, a trend that starts developing in monopolization law roughly around 1975, roughly, roughly around the time of um, Arita's, the Rita and Turner article on predatory pricing, which pointed to the, the, the costs of uh, false convictions, or, or, or I should have put it, uh, yep, uh, erone, um, convictions of firms that um, have engaged in largely efficient conduct. And after that, after the, after the, the Arita and Turner article, we start seeing some decisions that start um, moving toward what you could say, describe as, as a specific intent approach to monopolization cases. And so, for example, the best examples, are, best examples are the Trinco decision involving essential facilities, involving access to facilities that rivals say they need access to to compete. So the Trinco decision is a step in the direction of the specific intent test. You have the Brook Group decision, Matsushita and Brook Group decisions moving the predatory pricing standard toward a specific intent test. So you had some movement back toward the specific intent test and a, a kind of fractured standard under Section 2 uh, monopolization test. So there is, the question was open when the Microsoft uh, court uh, case came up, what kind of approach would the court take? Would it embrace this welfare balancing approach or would it embrace the specific intent approach that we see in cases like Brook Group or Trinco? And the appeals court openly embraces the welfare balancing test. Now, the only problem for that for someone who teaches is that when the court applies the test, it does so in a way that, that's a little confusing and, and, and consistent. Um, some of, the, some of the conduct that the court, first of all, when it applies the test, it, it doesn't really balance it in the few cases where it finds that Microsoft's uh, conduct, that Microsoft has a, a good defense, a good pro-competitive defense, well, it, it says, okay, you're, you're okay. We don't find a violation, no real balancing. So it seems to be conducted in a way that's similar to the specific intent test. And then um, when you look at the, the kind of conduct that Microsoft, that was approved by the court, it was pretty much the same as some of the conduct that was not approved. And so it's kind of hard to see why the court um, uh, picked some areas where it's uh, some types of conduct. I mean, this is maybe what Harry was getting to when he said picking apart and, and picking pieces of what Microsoft did. Picked some pieces and said that's okay, and other pieces and said that's not okay because there wasn't a big dif difference. Uh, and moreover, when you get to the tying part of the opinion, the court um, looks at some of the same conduct and decides to apply the rule of reason test. Why? Because of the efficiency arguments in favor of that conduct. So uh, it's the, the, the opinion seems very consistent in that way, both in its treatment of Microsoft's conduct and in the way it applies the law under tying and the law under uh, monopolization. So that, 
that uh, sort of muddies the picture, makes it hard to uh, teach the law, uh, and I assume it's hard, makes it a little difficult for lower courts to figure out what they're doing uh, as a result of this case. All right, I was going to make a brief comment on in innovation and monopolization. So, um, you know, even if you've got a monopoly that does nothing good, that uh, doesn't do anything efficient or pro-consumer, just raises the price and extracts surplus from consumers and imposes a deadweight loss on the economy by restricting output. You know, even in those cases, if the firm innovates, there's still a benefit there. And there, you know, now I'm going into the famous Schumpeterian argument uh, on monopolization. Um, because what the firm is doing in that case is, sure, it, is, it extracts welfare from consumers when it monopolizes. On the other hand, there's, there's that big residual surplus that's there that consumers have that was the result of the firm's innovation. And the innovation may have been directly related to the firm's incentive. Uh, the incentive to innovate may have been directly related to the firm's ability to monopolize that market later. So even, even in the worst case scenario where you have a firm that doesn't do anything efficient but innovates, there's an economic case for being careful about punishing those firms because consumers have benefited to the extent, in fact, benefited in a big way from the residual surplus that they, that they get as a result of the firm's innovation. And that kind of, that's sort of a basic Econ 101 message that um, isn't stressed enough, in my view, in the, in the, in, in the courses. Uh, you know, uh, it's sort of mentioned on the side, oh, yeah, there's the Schumpeterian argument. But it strikes me this is awfully important in a case like Microsoft and when you apply monopolization law to innovative industries. And it's a reason to, to make you think about, carefully about the remedies uh, and to be careful about the way you apply the monopolization standard. Okay, I was going to say, I think the last point that I'm coming to is the, uh, the U.S. and the world, or the U.S. and the EU. So the experience that we've gotten out of this case is that uh, the EU will take fairly aggressive arguments that are raised by enforcement authorities here and will run, run a lot further with them. Um, and and that's, that's a problem because we have different systems. The evolution of, of monopolization law here is very different from what's happening in the EU. Uh, here we have a court-driven process so that when the DOJ or the FTC go into court here in the U.S., they have to worry about what's going to happen because courts are independent. Courts apply their rule of reason standard and they have an independent reasoning process when they develop that standard. And so the FTC doesn't go into court thinking, ah, you know, the, the appeals court or this court is going to defer to us on important questions because, you know, we're the agency. We're the experts on this. In fact, if, if anything, uh, they're, they're uh, often uh, disappointed to find out how little deference they get in the courts. In the EU, it's a different, different ball game because they have a manifest error doctrine that's applied by the courts. So it's pretty much a deference rule. The European Commission uh, gets to make decisions on economic matters, on the facts, and for the most part, the court of first instance is going to defer to the European Commission. I, th I think it's an enormous difference, and I, th I think it's one that, that uh, is worrisome in terms of the divergence between monopolization law in the U.S. and in the EU. They're in a, they're in a, the European Commission is in a position to, to be a lot more aggressive uh, and not to have to worry about running into brick wall in the courts in the, in the first place, in, the most, in, in most cases. Uh, so for that reason, I, I think it, it implies that um, you know, it's, it's sort of an obvious thing that enforcement agencies have to be aware that their aggressive positions, at least in today's world, are going to become a different issue when they go into the more than 100 competition law regimes around the world because they're, they're not operating on the same legal systems, that, uh, same legal system that we have here. So maybe the, maybe the difference between the US, U.S. and the EU is really a common law versus civil law distinction because the civil law is uh, sort of takes a more top-down approach and takes its rules from what the government says, develops its rules from what the government says about the law. Maybe that's the core of it, but we have different, different reasoning processes that are driving the law. And so as a result, 
Uh, I wouldn't be optimistic about some convergence, about convergence between U.S. monopolization law and European Union monop monopolization law. Uh, there's, there's a real concern there that the European Union will uh, keep going on a much more aggressive track and, and will not face the strong headwinds that our enforcement agencies run into when they go into court. I'll stop there. That's great. Thank you, Keith. Thanks for Thank fitting you. so much into a tight lock. And last up, uh, Doug. So how much time do we have? Uh, 15 minutes. Go ahead and take it all. We'll, we'll squeeze. We'll figure it out somehow. I, I don't want to cut you short, so go ahead. I just 15 minutes to keep you guys from lunch. Good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the assignment, Phil. Um, <laughs> it's one of my three favorite meals. <laughs> okay. Um, among the many wise things that Brad Smith said was, is that um, perspectives really matter, and those of us, with, the people with different perspectives are going to take away different things from this, uh, this case and this saga. And, and regard different things as important. My perspective is that of an antitrust lawyer. I'm not a computer junkie and I'm not an internet junkie. I'm gonna look at this as a matter of antitrust law. And if I can do it in 15 minutes, I'm gonna to touch briefly upon four topics. One, very briefly, I wasn't planning to do, but I'm provoked to do it by what a number of people, including Harry, have said. And that is the, the issue of remedy. We might get to this in greater detail in the, in the round table at the end of the day, but uh, there's been an implicit, uh, I think, premise in a lot of the conversation in the last 24 hours here that what this case is all about or what, how it should be measured is by the quality or the efficacy of an injunctive remedy intended to restore competition to the market in, in, in which there was a, thought to be a competition problem. Uh, and, and Harry went so far as to suggest that the failure of remedy or flunking remedy 101 might discredit the whole antitrust enterprise. Others have said, uh, certain government officials have said, if you don't have a good remedy in mind, you shouldn't bring the case. Uh, and by remedy, I mean I'm talking about injunctive remedies to restore competition. I think this is a very wrong-headed way uh, to think about antitrust. Uh, there are a lot of reasons to bring cases other than an injunctive remedy to restore competition. After all, we do not refrain from uh, prosecuting murder cases simply because we cannot resurrect the corpse. And I'll uh, elaborate on that maybe later. Um, uh, okay. Point two, history is written by the winners. And when it's written by the winners, you, you take what the winners say as if it's true, um, and I'm gonna assume, of course, that the winners here, what they say was true, but you also overlook what you thought or, or what the world might have thought before, before the victory, before the winners got to write it. And I think it's important to remember some of the contributions of this case to the way we think about the world because there are things I believe that we take for granted now that were not taken for granted 10 years ago. Network effects is one of them. When this case was filed, network effects were an important part of the government's theory of the case and the, and, and the, and the application's barrier to entry. Uh, and yet, there was a tremendous public debate. I, I, I think at least maybe the majority of the commentary at that time said, oh, this is all poppycock. There were articles written saying that the quirky story about the typewriter key, which was one of the fables that, uh, on which the network's effects thing was built, that that was all a bunch of nonsense, and that's really not how QWERTY came to be. Um, uh, there were other articles that said if network effects, and arguments that were made that if network effects meant anything, they would mean that, that um, uh, uh, the, the incumbent had an impregnable monopoly, and look how, in fact, you know, we went from, from uh, um, uh, busy calc to I uh, forget the, the other you know, series of of, of uh, schumpeterian changes in these so-called network industries. It's all a bunch of, of, of hokum. And today, I think uh, nobody says that. I think we understand network effects uh, is a staple in the way that we view the world. Uh, second, uh, it was thought ten years ago that tying theory was about leveraging from the tying product market to the tied product market. Uh, now we understand. Uh, that tying uh, it, it can be looked at more, uh, more broadly as bundling products for the purpose of, among other things, depending on the circumstances, protecting the market power uh, uh, or uh, in or excluding rivals from the tying product market. And Dennis Carlton, certainly no leftist, uh, wrote, I think, the first major academic piece uh, sort of uh, formalizing that way of, uh, of looking at it. Dennis, for those of you who, who don't know, um, uh, was a, a student of, of uh, Frank uh, Fisher at MIT and then became the benefactor of the endowed chair uh, that Frank now uh, now owns. Uh, that, I, think he, I think he was able to become a benefactor. I gave him a good grade, you know. Uh, well, I, I, <laughs> he, he always spoke highly of that and said, um, 
And then Lexicon had its IPO and he was able to endow it. Okay. Um, so this new way of thinking about tying and bundling, which has spawned to some extent a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, controversies in, in, in bundled pricing as well as tying law, uh, I think was again a product uh, of the Microsoft case. Uh, product design, innovation, what's the role of antitrust? Coming at the heels of the IBM cases, there was a, 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 a substantial reason to believe in antitrust, that antitrust doctrine 10 years ago uh, created virtually no room for an antitrust court to second guess a product design. A lot of dicta in cases, no real hard holdings, I suppose. A lot of dicta and almost holdings in cases said, courts, we don't know what to do. We can't second guess. We, you know, we're not going to be as smart as the engineers at Microsoft. We shouldn't get into this enterprise. The consent decree appeal, court of appeals, came very close to saying that. Uh, uh, but at the end of the day, uh, the, um, uh, the, the unanimous uh, uh, DC Circuit per curiam court of, uh, uh, and bank court of appeals uh, it did second guess product design at a level that frankly surprised me when they held it was anti-competitive for Microsoft to co-mingle certain files. Um, and I think that means product design, while I think we all recognize something that the law should approach with considerable caution, is, is an, a legitimate subject of antitrust inquiry. Uh, and that wasn't something one would have taken for granted 10 years ago. Um, uh, uh, similarly, 10 years ago, antitrust was a rather formalistic uh, body of law in some ways. There were a lot of categories of analysis. And, and I think as Steve Holtzman or someone pointed out earlier, the, uh, uh, maybe it was Phil, um, uh, one of the reasons the complaint was written the way it was, starting off with exclusive dealing and then tying, was that there was plaintiff friendly section one doctrine uh, involving those categories. We always knew that this was a, 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 a case about monopolization. The question was how to present it to a judge in 1998. Back then, um, you could win a case or so you thought if you could show foreclosure of X percent of the market in an exclusive dealing case, or if you could show, um, uh, or you might lose a case if the exclusive dealing contract was not for a duration of more than a year. Uh, and other categories like that, of course, the, the per se rule in tying. The, the Court of Appeals opinion, and I think this, is, this is, will have an enduring, has had and will have an enduring impact in the way we think about antitrust, has basically said, let's get rid of all these categories. We don't care about 30% thresholds in one, year, uh, uh, in one year tests. We want to know on the facts of this case, was the conduct anti-competitive or exclusionary? That, I think, is a major, almost a paradigm shift uh, that we wouldn't have, have necessarily expected 10 years ago. Monopoly broth, it used to be said, I wrote this in a brief some years ago, zero plus zero still equals zero. How can you add up a, a, a bunch of conduct that doesn't violate the antitrust laws, accumulate it, and, and turn it into an antitrust violation? Well, the government argued in the D.C. Circuit implicitly uh, agreed, although it explicitly said it wasn't reaching the issue, implicitly agreed that if you take conduct that is anti-competitive by the appropriate standard, I'll get to that in a second, and it has a tiny impact such that that particular aspect of conduct doesn't have enough of an impact on competition to, to, to violate Section 2, but you have a whole mess of that conduct, the cumulative effect of which is, has a sufficient effect on competition to, to, to injure competition. That can violate Section 2, and that's a new way of thinking about antitrust that I think is now, is now conventional. So I think we should not forget the many things that, that antitrust now takes for granted uh, that were uh, either surprising or at least hotly contested 10 years ago. Okay, third topic. Um, uh, the case didn't resolve everything, obviously, in terms of antitrust doctrine. Uh, one of the most interesting and important things where it really kind of, it, it, it maybe stirred up a hornet's nest, was the antitrust intellectual property interface. Uh, Microsoft argued uh, a, a constellation of arguments about innovation, high technology industries, high fixed costs, low variable cost industries and intellectual property and said this is not something that, that antitrust tools, antitrust doctrine is well equipped to grapple with. And, a court, and they did raise, obviously, some difficult questions. Court of Appeals uh, uh, unanimously said um, uh, uh, poppycock, in fact, characterized uh, uh, Microsoft's most sweeping uh, uh, argument of a kind of intellectual property immunity uh, as bordering on the frivolous. Um, uh, and and uh, gave sort of short shrift to its arguments that because we're talking about the uh, aspects of its copyrighted software, it was in a safe harbor. Now, that was just the tip of the iceberg. Now we have, a, a, of course, a, a robust industry, which I'm having a lot of fun with, in, in the intersection of antitrust and intellectual property. Uh, 
uh, in, in all sorts of areas um, involving um, uh, uh, patent pool, standard setting, and, and, and who knows what else. So this case didn't, uh, Microsoft didn't resolve it, but it certainly put put it on the table for antitrust, uh, the grist for the antitrust mill. And then finally, and somewhat disappointingly from my perspective, the case did not resolve the question of what do we mean by any competitive conduct for Section 2 of the Sherman Act. The government had argued uh, uh, essentially for what has now come to be known as the no economic sense test, that is to say, uh, would this conduct have made economic sense for the defendant if it had not excluded rivals and enabled the defendant to gain or a preserved market power it otherwise wouldn't have had? Uh, that's not, um, uh, uh, I think, uh, contrary to uh, uh, what Professor Hilton said, I don't think that test is inconsistent at all with a dynamic innovation uh, 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 sen sensitive analysis because all you have to do in that analysis and what the government argued in this case is you, you ask yourself would the legitimate payoffs of an investment in innovation have justified uh, uh, this conduct uh, had, even if it had not um, uh, uh, raised rivals costs in ways that, uh, that, that created additional market power. Um, that's a fairly conservative test. The D.C. Circuit appeared to, to go beyond that to the left uh, by saying, no, 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 we're not, gonna, we're not just going to look at that question. Uh, we're going to uh, balance uh, in, in cases where there's both benefit and harm. We're going to balance the two. But in its application, I'm not sure the D.C. Circuit actually meant that. I'm not sure any court has actually ever balanced. What the D.C. Circuit seemed to do is to say, if I can think, not if I can think, if there is an efficiency that is proven for the conduct, even if that efficiency wouldn't have justified the defendant's investment, that is to say, wouldn't have been enough to make the conduct profitable for the defendant. If there is an efficiency, defendant's going to win. If there's no efficiency and there's harm to competition, only then does the plaintiff win. Uh, but that issue's not been resolved because it's not clear what the D.C. Circuit meant, and there's a it's, uh, the, the, the DOJ uh, Section 2 report and the FTC uh, 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 assault on it clearly indicate uh, the widespread disagreement about that critical question of what is anti-competitive conduct for Section 2. Fourth and final point I want to make, and this is something I think is lost sight of, or, uh, although I have a hunch that, that our uh, friends from Microsoft haven't lost sight of it. The Microsoft case, U.S. v. Microsoft, was a doctrinally, to my lights, a very conservative case. Not, you know, completely hard right, but a very conservative case. The conduct standard was this no economic sense standard, uh, which is way to the, to the right of an uh, ad hoc balancing test, uh, way to the right of, of where uh, the EC is, even to the right in this respect of the DOJ's recently re released report, which explicitly said we don't like the no economic sense test because it would permit a defendant to prevail with a modest efficiency contribution to society, even if there's a substantial long run uh, impact on rivals and, and on competition. Um, uh, uh, so, uh, measured, I guess, by where antitrust doctrine is today, uh, the case, I think, was was quite modest, and if it, if it was not a conservative case in its contribution, it may be uh, mostly because it stirred the pot and, and perhaps contributed to where the EC is today and, and to where the FTC uh, wants to be today. Wonderful. Thank you. That's a, a huge tour of uh, topics in a very short time. I appreciate this.